So NFSD is under new management. Um, it was uh, Bruce Fields for many, many years. I guess he was the heir apparent. Um, Neil gave him the maintainership back in, I think, 2007 or 8 or 9. Um, and he did it for a long time. Uh, and then last year he stepped back and he's sort of enjoying a sabbatical from, from the uh, IT sector. Um, he's well. Uh, I'm not. I'm not trying to cover anything up there. I just. He just decided it was time to enjoy his son growing up, and that's what he's done. Um, so I became the maintainer of NFSD in January of last year, and Jeff joined me as co-maintainer. Um, when was that? I guess July, June, July of last year. Um, and Jeff has done this before, so. I'm ably assisted by him. Um, I have some interesting priorities for this work. Um, NFSD has some features in it that no other implementation in the industry has. Um, for example, NFS over RDMA, um, support for um, just about every fabric you can imagine. Um, OPA, which is obsolete, uh, iWarp, Rocky, Infiniband, um, and a couple that I'm not even aware of. NFS over RDMA, RDMA works on all of them. Um, our client does too. Um, and no other uh, NFS server can say that. So that's a good thing. We also have uh, support for NFSD 4.2. That's pretty rare in the industry. Um, so those are things we can be proud of and I, I hope I can extend that winning streak a little bit. Um, I guess my priorities are number one, you know, functionality, making sure that we're still on the top of the list there. Uh, number two, security. Um, number three, and I've been working on both GSS Kerberos um, and uh, RPC with TLS, um, which is a sort of newfangled thing that allows us to do uh, intransitive encryption of NFS without the use of Kerberos, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, the cloud folks have been asking for this for, well, I guess since 2018. and but. I think we're about in a position where we can deliver it, so we're pleased about that. Um, the third is performance and scalability, and that's kind of what this talk is going to be about. And the fourth is observability, which means the ability to trace the operation of a server and, and do diagnostics on a live server without impacting performance or, or uh, scalability of the server. So I'm way into trace points. I should be into BPF, but I haven't fully tasted it yet. Um, I guess that's next. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like trace points and I, I've been putting them in wherever I can. Um, I believe it's still not here. So um, anecdotally, I, uh, I've had some reports that NFS reads are slow. Um, reads uh, for a long time, I think s for like almost 20 years, have used uh, a pipe splice mechanism, um, which is poorly documented, and um, we broke it pretty badly um, last year in a couple of ways. Um, Al broke it when he did his uh, pipe iterator work, and I broke it because there was a piece of it that was really not documented at all, and I said, what do we need this for, and yanked it out. And uh, now we know what we need it for. <laughs> um, anyway, but I'm, I'm told that it's, it's not performing very well. Um, I have not measured this myself, but um, so it's, it's something that I'd like to pay some attention to and try to understand basically uh, how we need to do it better and how we're going to um, join the rest of uh, the file system family by um, going to fol support folios and IOMAP and all those wonderful things. Um, and um, Write also has some performance problems that are not related to what Read does, but uh, they both sort of rely on this structure called XDR buff. Um, this is the, th the, um, the basic way that we track the assembly of RPC messages. Um, and we put them together from, oh, it went all the way out. We put it together f 
from uh, a KVEC that's got the actual RPC header in it, that's head. Um, a, um, the, the classic way to do it is with pages. So an array of pages that contains the, the read or write payload. Um, and then tail. And tail, <laughs> tail usually contains things like a, a, a GSS checksum or it can contain um, an XDR pad. X, uh, RPC messages have to be a multiple of four bytes, four octets in length. And um, so that's what that tail is there is for. And then this other information is for doing zero copy um, out of the pages. You basically can point to an offset into the first page in the array and say, start here. Don't start at the, at byte zero of that page. So start in the middle of it. And then these fields down here record both the maximum length that the buffer contain and the actual length of the RPC message in the buffer. So you may notice there is already a BioVec in here. That sort of was pasted in a few years ago because we thought, okay, BioVecs are the wave of the future. So let's get started and put that in there. And the client uses that. The server kind of doesn't. Um, one of the things that's sort of stopped me from doing it is that not everything can support a BioVec yet. There are no BioVec enabled APIs for RDMA, for example. So I haven't gone whole hog on it. Um, but I guess BioVec is something that at least the socket layer is, is willing to. And so we could use it for that. Um, but I'm just, I'm not sure how to bridge the gaps. Um, IOMAP is, is also interesting. Uh, I'm told that one of the things that IOMAP can do that we're really interested in is it can uh, read a sparse file from a local file system without actually um, triggering the mechanism that fills in pages with zeros. Um, Chenner told me that if you read an unallocated extent in a sparse file, that will force it to actually allocate blocks on the disk and fill them in with zeros. And we don't want we don't want an NFS read to do that, um, especially with really large files. We would like to preserve the the unallocated extents as they are until they're actually written into. Um, so that's something we're thinking about using IOMAP for. And I guess maybe that's the yes, way we want to do. Somebody is somebody online. Okay, hang on. Maybe I just heard my own echo. Um, so maybe we want to replace the splice stuff. Al Al's got his hand up. Uh, in which situation would read uh, fill uh, gaps in sparse file? That's. That might be something strange XFS specific, but was uh, on some strange file system. But normally, read shouldn't help. Read should be possible on read-only file system, right? Yeah. So, so I, I don't think so. We'll allocate any blocks. Yeah. But what happens if you fill in page cache pages or something? Yes, like that's, that's a different story. Yeah. So, and you could save even that. Yeah, you could avoid instantiating page cache mm -hmm. full of zeros over the, in the over the hole and that's what you can save by using IOMAP. Uh, okay, we we want to do that too. Um, we have a, a new operation in NFS v4.2 called read plus um, where you where the the operation can actually distinguish between data and holes the basically unallocated extents. Yeah, it's a sparse read. Um, so the client can ask for, tell me, what, you know, I want to read this particular byte range and the server can respond either, okay, here's the data, or it can say, oh, there's um, nothing there on the, on the server and it, it has a very compact representation of the, of the hole and that saves the net network bandwidth. Um, so yeah, we certainly would like to, we would like the server to do the least amount of work possible when reading these. Um, yeah, so, so this is what IOMAP is good for because it yeah. basically it will communicate to you in a compact way that this is happening. So I, I probably misunderstood what, what Dave said, but. But uh, <coughs> you can't just, I mean, I <coughs> excuse me, IOMAP is a, is a function that file systems use typically. I mean, if we are reading some random file system under the hood and we call into IOMAP to, to do this, like maybe I was exported DPAP or something, right, to the next. 
yeah, th this will be, you know, file systems will have to be made with IO map. So we're, we're probably going to need some kind of uh, operation, like uh, operation vector where, you know, it gets called in, so the file system say, I support IO map, and here are the IO map functions that NFS can particularly install. It kind of sounds like some version of FIE map, which we currently do, which is like user space facing API, and like, or seek data, seek whole, that, that will, yeah, so, so like we would have to think how to make this work for you in a very clean manner, but, but in principle, these are the use, user space That's facing That's exactly APIs. why we're not using PyMap today, is because of the races. <coughs> uh, the other thing that's probably worth noting is in addition to a flag, which is should you even try calling um, the functions, and if we actually have a separate uh, 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 IOMAPS ops, you can just simply check to see whether you have a pointer to that. Mm -hmm. It may very well be that on a per file system or per file basis, the file system may say, I don't support IOMAP on this file because it's data journaled or something like that. And then you would try to call it, you'd get like a EOP not supported or some such and then fall back to the page cache uh, methodology. Um, so we'll need to do that because especially for EXT4, what we've been planning on doing is supporting IOMAP gradually um, so we would do it for the easy cases first and then add support for the more complex cases later. Um, and so just a heads up, we'll, this new interface will probably have for this particular file can't help you fall back. Or we might just not bother doing IOMAP reads from that file system until it supports it for everything. So that's yeah, I, I think the challenge there is, is that what might happen is will support it for like 99% of the file systems out there. And it would be kind right. of a shame if you didn't use it just because there was this 1% of like FS script file systems that like almost never show up on, on a data center server, right? So, so a couple of things about that. One is that um, not all file systems are exportable. So the ones that are not exportable, we don't have to worry about in the first place. Uh, and the second is we already have a bifurcation in the read processing in the NFS server because sometimes we can do a, a read with a, a splice pipe and sometimes we cannot and we have to use a, an iterator. Um, one of the main reasons why we'd have to use an iterator is if there are, there are more than one read operation in NFS4 compound, we can't do the fast, so-called fast version of read in that case. Um, Consider on FS itself, somebody trying to re-export NFS and uh, your operation tell me that, uh, well, give me data or tell me that there is a gap. Looks like uh, rather useful for re-exporting, right? But you are not going to see IOMAP for NFS. IOMAP for, for NFS client. Yeah, that, that sounds right. Um, so what you need is something that tells you that wh where the gaps are. IMAP certainly does it, but... Uh, I think I think read plus probably, we'd have to, to carry that through to the lower file system in that case. Uh, otherwise, it's just, yeah, it's not gonna work. What we really need, I think, is an atomic sparse read op. That's actually that's say, what we're say going I want to read for. this range and get back a series. Of that's what we're going for with uh, IOMAP. Yeah. So what what I want to know is how useful is the page cache on an NFS server? Because if you have many 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 clients, the, the their combined working set might well be larger than very much larger than the work than the memory of the server. That's one possibility. It depends on the workload heavy. Yeah. And, and there are also tons of workloads. Because I'm, well, what I'm wondering is whether this is a direct I/O operation or this is a page cache operation, and we, it sounds like we don't actually know the answer to this one. Um, there is no way, good way to find out. Um, we basically rely on the page cache and balance dirty pages and all the rest of that um, infrastructure to determine whether um, pages are going to be kept in the cache or whether they're going to be read in once and then thrown away. 
Um, some servers actually have a, the ability to make smart decisions about that, and ours doesn't. Because they're, they're so certain servers like to have uh, like these little very low powered CPUs and only a, like a handful, hundreds of megabytes of memory um, and just use that as, as the basis of being a file server. And our servers are generally large, like gigabytes and gigabytes of RAM. So we do rely on a page cache for that. I, I just have to flip the kind of burden. So you want to like this read uh, after read parse or how, however you call it to be automated exactly with respect to what? Like with the write to the file or no, we don't. I mean, just with itself. I mean, like uh, right now, uh, they, there was an, an implementation at one point that handled this that uh, used file map, but the problem is, you know, things can change after you get your map, and so we were, it just wasn't the time right now to, to do that. So what we really need is a way to, you know, do we need to do what IOMAP does. Uh, I'm not sure that IOMAP. We don't want right to. We don't want to lock. That, for that. You know, we, we need In other words, you want it atomic with respect to hole punching and truncate at the very least. Yes. Because that's where fire, uh, fire map uh, gets completely screwed. Yes. I didn't actually use FIE map. I was doing just seeks with seek hole or seek data. Yeah, but, but the, the same thing. The same. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this is, this is Derek here. I, I was also kind of wondering. So if you get once you get the IO map mapping, what do you do about whatever may or may not be in the page cache, since the the IO mapping itself tells you nothing at all about what's in the page cache. Well, it tells you what parts you can expect to find data in and what parts are going to be unallocated. Um, and then the re read plus uh, reply can be built, the server can build that reply based on that mapping information and it can do reads on just the parts where it expects data and it can return holes where the IO map information says there's nothing there. Yeah, but there are, there are other weird traps to that. Like it can t if it tells you that there's an unwritten mapping on XFS, there actually can be dirty pages in the page cache in front of that unwritten mapping, but you'll never know. And like that's part of, and like the uh, seek data implementation for IO map does actually notice that it's been fed an unwritten mapping and then it goes and plonking its way through the page cache to see if there are any pages in there. Yeah, so, so seek, the whole seek data would be definitely like the better API and, and so it would an asset, but still it has the ra like race problem that you can get that, you know, here should be whole and then suddenly there is a bug because someone filled it badly. But then the question is why, yeah, you could possibly check i generation after you have like filled in the request to see whether you yeah so yeah you could basically use i version to see whether something has changed with the i node after you have formed the request so we or, have or we could just say we don't make a promise about it you know if you're going to use the read plus you might get some a, a fractured uh, piece of the file no no i i i don't like that at all moses chair um, so one other possibility is that we expand the page cache's abilities to store there is no data here because so 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 right right now file systems have to you know, mem set page entire pages to zero if you're reading through a sparse file. We could free the pages that we previously allocated and say and and put in a special entry that says no data here. That's a lot of work. But I mean, it's it's certainly something I've been thinking very seriously about doing. That would be yeah. useful on the client side decoding too. I mean, I, I was kind of wondering, like, do you uh, do you actually want something along the lines of here's a file position, read, read, read whatever data you can find at at or at any higher offset, and then tell me where you actually got it from. Ceph has a sparse read, you know, wire operation for its OSD, and what it does is it sends you a, a you get an array of um, of extents, basically, you know, you know, position length, and then after that, all the data is concatenated at the end of it. Um, I don't know if that's useful here, uh, but I, 
some IT specific model we want to go for. It would be nice to be able to do a read into the DFS and, and get back this sort of info and, and, uh, and instruct us to move to the, to the next. Well, I, I don't see how we can avoid a race there where someone might fill in an un unallocated extent while you're doing the read plus. It's, it seems unavoidable. Yeah, well, so well, I, I don't see how we can avoid the situation that I said before, we just don't make the promise. If you need that promise, then you lock the file. Yeah, either that or we just rely on the lower cost to kind of do that. Because like like EXT4 and XFS lock the our new text to the buffer three. Yeah. And so we, which we do now, I think that's, I thought it so did, I looked yesterday, I thought it did. So maybe, I'm <laughs> okay, maybe I'm wrong. So <laughs> if we don't make that promise, yeah. I think Anna said at one point that actually breaks an FS test with uh, when we're using read plus. Okay, I'm mistaken. Yeah, I remember it doing that. Oh, can we guarantee? I try to lock the file before decoding with seeks and seek will try to lock it and again and we end up in a deadlock, is what I was also seeing. Uh, how can we guarantee that uh, uh, nobody will, local to server, uh, want to write something into uh, that area, just as the data, just as our reply is being transmitted to client? There, yeah, I don't think there's a way of doing that. And and it's likely we already have that problem with reg regular old fashioned read. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. If the, if, uh, if folks are going to do something stupid, they 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 deserve what they get. <laughs> it's glib, but I guess it's a fact of life. We can't actually even guarantee it for local file systems. I mean, if you were doing it as two or three separate NFS read operations, it's undefined what happens if someone, you know, is modifying the file out from under you between reads number two and three. If you do a compound read, saying that the result of the compound read has to be atomic, I just, I'm not sure how much value that actually adds. Now, maybe that breaks yeah, we certain don't make specifications, that but like, yeah, if, if, if you don't need to make that guarantee, don't. <laughs> I think it's not worth it. Right, so NFS V4 compounds do not guarantee atomicity across the operation. Okay, so the reason why Willie's here is to talk about folios and maybe give us uh, steps one, two, or three um, for uh, getting uh, folio support into the NFS server. And that's kind of why I have this uh, structure up on the screen is because, you know, where do we, where do we plumb this in? Um, essentially, we're building something that looks a lot like send file and receive file. Um, and uh, what we've done traditionally is we've got uh, an array of pages and on the receive side that uh, on the server, the, um, that's a bunch of anonymous pages and the network layer, layer reads into them. And um, on the send side, um, at least for sockets, um, the pages involved in the RPC message are given to the socket and then released from the page array and we fill, in, fill those in with new anonymous pages for the next request. Um, so, I mean, you've said in the past to me things like, uh, it's not good to take a, folio, a, a fully allocated folio and then break it up into little pages. Roy. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not here to tell you how to write your code. Um, I mean, I, I can tell you about how things have how, how you can work well with the MN layer and, and with the file system layer and the I, I would like and so that. on. Um, so the, 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 the point of the Folios project is to ma manage memory in larger chunks. So if you go to the page allocator and say, give me an order five, pay, or order five folio, it will, it will do that. But if you then split it up into 32 order zero pages, it's like, well, I could have done that for you. 
um, put it out more efficiently than, than, than you could like allocating to one great meetup. Um, so if you are going to allocate larger folios, and please do, because the larger we keep, the larger chunks we keep memory in, the better it is for fragmentation for the whole system. Keep it there. Don't break it up. So maybe when may, may, maybe you allocate more than five folio, and then you use only half of it before you reuse it for something else. Um, but you know, don't don't try and over optimize. Don't 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 say, well, I only need 23 pages, and 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 I'll I'll use the others for something else. You're probably better off just using the first 23 pages of the folio, leaving the other nine pages for just free for a while, and then once you're done with that request having that 13-page folio yeah. available again. I suspect that the issue is the way we do send, mm. uh, and that is we give the pages to the network layer, um, and that's where we're getting this sort of, okay, I just gave the network layer nine pages, and I need to fill them up back in, and that's, that's kind of where we're getting this page at a time behavior. Um, so if we didn't do that, maybe we could just allocate a bunch of folios and leave them in place. I'm not sure. If, if only Dave Howells had come to this talk, because he, he's, he's way more into what the network layer is doing with pages slash folios than, than, than I am. I have been happily leaving that mostly to him. But yeah, he kind of asked for this session. So. <laughs> Bad Dave, naughty Dave. No biscuit. No biscuit today. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think sort of from a, from a system-wide perspective, we are very much looking to have everybody deal with arbitrary order folios where they currently use pages. And a lot of that stuff just works. It, it, it isn't necessarily guaranteed to work, but a lot of places, you know, you, you, you pass them the first page of the folio and they actually work. Um, you know, you, you, you have to be a bit brave to do that. Um, you probably want to go and audit and make sure they really are going to just work. But, you know, if you call put page on actually any page in a folio, it will decrement the reference count on the folio itself. So you know, a, a lot of stuff does work. Um, I don't want to say just try it, because uh, that's what I started doing <laughs> when I was working. <laughs> when I was converting the page cache to folios, it's like, nah, try it. And lots of things crashed and broke, and, and I fixed them one by one, and, and, and we got to where we are today. Um, but, you know, we, we read through, okay, what does the network layer do with this page? Can it handle being told, oh yeah, there, there are 30,000 bytes in this page? Does it, does it just work? Does it just copy 30,000 bytes out of that one page? Because if it does, you can pass it a very big folio. Um, he want, uh, Dave wanted to convert the, the our use of send page, kernel send page to send message. Yes. Yes, um, using I an iterator. Yes. Um, so, uh, are you planning to, or are you or Dave planning to uh, implement an iterator that you can hand a folio to and it will deal with it? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So, 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 so that, that that that's why he's doing it. So that 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 send message can take in. It, I think it's a biovec. Uh, right there. Right there. So yeah, it, it can just take in a biovec and iterate over it, and biovex can already contain. Um, if I just say folios, uh, believe me, uh, it, it, it is it is still typed as being a struct page, but actually it, the the struct page that is used in a biovec is used only or mostly for its properties as a descriptor of memory. Um, so that would look like a single entry biovec with a, a very large length and yes. would that struct page would just point to a folio. Yes, yes. it's already possible yeah. and uh, iterbivec uh, actually does it. Uh, the trouble is uh, that Dave seems to want to uh, mix uh, kvec and bvec to do uh, heterogeneous uh, iterators which I think is complete nightmare. It's going to be a bunch of overhead for no good reason. So if that's, so yeah, that's it, madness, it saves you two calls, but uh, yeah, defining semantics of that is. I was going to say, if that's madness, then I think it it wouldn't be difficult to convert the head and tail kvex into pages, for just one page. That's that's true. It could be a very short bit biovec. 
Yeah, yeah. they're generally not bigger than a page anyway. So, yeah. Well, uh, you can't do it unless uh, that stuff uh, sits in something came out and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we just use uh, Vertipage and yeah, get the page address. No, right. but, but, if, but if it came from a slab because you can't do that because it's playing games with the reference element. I see. So it does because when you pin a, when you grab a reference on a page, uh, you are guaranteed that uh, page page won't go away. But K Malik and K Free have no idea that somebody behind us uh, behind the, the backs grabbed the reference to that page. It was K Free. Hey, no problem. Pages for <clears throat> the, this range of addresses is free, can be reused by KML account. And then you have trouble. Okay, we'll just have to be careful. Um, but I, I don't think that I don't think that's rocket science. We just need to be careful. Yeah, I, I think if you're using KML to allocate that already, then you just switch over to using the page yes. allocated directory. Right. Yeah. You can probably even use the same struct page for both. You just use different ranges in it. Yes. Yeah, in fact, that's the common case is that the head and tail KVEX point into the same page. Ah, that should work. Yeah. I think the client side does KMALIC um, for the head and tail. I don't think the server does. In most cases, it just uses a page and splits it up. OK. Thank you, helpful. Um, now's an opportunity if anybody has complaints or rotten fruit to throw, um, I'm happy to entertain questions or comments. Or duck, yes. I have one question. Um, um, I've tested the workload of this sequential array from the server. performance work. Uh, the problem is that uh, NFS server can uh, split your uh, IO request into multiple threads. What I would have been happy to have is affinity per item for IO. I tried to look up at how to do that and I couldn't figure out how it could be done, but similar to IO Ewing because if you're writing to an XFS file system and you're breaking those writes and reads into different into threads, you get poor performance because of the shared uh, uh, read write lock. Oh, uh, I see. So it's like you would like at least fifty percent degradation in sequential writes or something. Aha! The guilty party arrives. Okay, you can answer that, but by, I don't know, it's hard. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you about that offline. That's uh, okay. basically not the way the NFS server is architected, but we can talk about ways of helping that situation. Okay. Well, I can't answer a question unless you can ask me. Yeah, I guess, I guess we fixed the problem, so. <laughs> well, that wasn't needed. The question really was, what the hell are you playing at, Dave? And I, I, th I think we answered that. Yeah, we were looking at the XTR buff struct and trying to figure out how to make get rid of the head and tail in KVEX, at least on the server. Um, I think we figured out how to do that. I, I was happy to do that. Only a bit. He's on the call. He's listening. <laughs> 